So I want to encourage you guys, even before I get into the message, is I, I think worship is one of the most intriguing things that we got to do. And, and going back to even a little bit to what Pastor Gabriel preached a few weeks ago, is there is something in particular that happens when you release the sound in your vocal cords. That's different than a guitar, different than some drums and keys. The Bible says that, that it, it literally pulls in heaven to listen to what you're saying. So I, I want you to be bold in the place of worship. Not just when you sing, but, but when you wake up in the morning, that, that, that when you begin to lift your voice, heaven begins to turn its ear to you, according to the Psalms. I, this, this, this is a quote I live by. It's, um, it's hanging in my office. It's hanging at home. And this is what I want to be known by. It's here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. They have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them. You can disagree with them. You can glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. I want to be crazy. You know, I'm in a season where I feel like God is inviting me to begin to have faith beyond reason. What I mean by that is as I'm, I'm gearing up for what I feel God is calling and what he's saying and what he's doing, I found myself being reasonable with the expectations that are given to me. And I feel like God is saying, even for your heart, and for, there's, there's an unlocking of saying, I have crazy faith to believe that God can do whatever God wants to do, and I'm just going to partner with his heart to see his heart come through, not just what I want to see. So I want to believe for things beyond what I can see, beyond what I can reason, beyond what I can put together in my own human logic to agree with heaven to bring heaven here. My title for today's sermon is Closing the Gap. And I think there's two gaps that often we, we think about is the gap between heaven and us and the gap between us and us. And, and I, you know, the Bible says this. He, say, he says this to John in, in, in the book of Revelation, John chapter 4, verse 1. He says, come up here, come up now, my beloved. I want to show you things. There's an invitation to go up, but I want you to understand what God calls you in the new covenant reality. He calls you the temple. You know, in, in old, old days when the Bible says where heaven and earth meet, when heaven and earth shall pass away, that was a reference to the temple. It's because it's where heaven met earth. So every time it says heaven and earth will not pass away, it's actually a reference to the reality of God coming into the temple. Beloved, you are where heaven meets earth. The Bible, in, 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 the early, in the early church, they would call these places where heaven made earth thin places. This on a Monday night, on a Sunday morning, when we gather here, it's a thin place because God meets us here. But beloved, it's not just here, it's when you walk out of here. You are a meeting place. I need you to believe this. This is not, this isn't mysticism. This is good theology that you are a meeting place for heaven to meet earth wherever you are. Sometimes we're looking, we're like, God, would you just move? Move! Stop looking for the move and be the move. Heaven is waiting. This is what the Bible says. The earth, the earth in Romans, the earth is groaning. For what? The manifestations of the sons of God. The earth is waiting for you to realize who you are. And then we have the gap between us and each other. Guys, and I, I'll preach this verse until I die. Because I, when, I, when I, I, get to, I get to travel a lot and do church work and fun stuff and preach, and I love it. I get to do it. <sighs> and I say this again, and I'll, I said it last week. I'm saying it this week. The most convicting verse in all of the Bible 
is somehow we've bought into the idea of the way we worship, people will know that we love Jesus. The way that I can quote the scripture. You know, we're, we're so funny. Like, I love theologians because I wish I was one, but I'm not. I love theology, but I'm not a theologian. And, um, but I'm pretty well versed in my own right. You know, I can hang with them. But theologians, I mean, they're so funny. I love these guys. But, like, you know, the Bible says, <laughs> it's like this. If I went to my kids and I told my kids, I heard Francis Chan once say this. If I told my kids to clean my room, to clean their rooms, and I came back to them and they, they just responded this way to me. Like, oh, Dad, we love your words. They're so life-giving to me. Boy, you ain't clean your room. Dad, I can quote it to you in the Greek so that you understand the complexities of what it means to clean my room. That's what we do with his word. When we look at it, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples is by the way you love one another. God, I know what love means in the Greek, the agape, the God. I know what it means, but we know what it means, but we don't do it. Because we're so self-seeking and selfish that we live within our own comforts and our own means. And if anybody hinges upon this, we even have preachers that begin to say, oh, you got to kick them out. Beloved, what it looks like to be like Jesus is to lay your life down for somebody you don't even know. I had, I remember when I was pastoring in Virginia, there was this, we, we had this, we had this church and it had a stoplight, right? We were a little bit off, off of the main road. We were a big church about um, we had a couple thousand, and, 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 and this one lady, she, she knew we were a church there because the traffic would be stopped. There was cops, and, and this one lady had a flat tire, and her car was broke down right outside of our church. And I don't leave typically on a Sunday because I stay till Sunday night. And it was my, the last pastor. It was almost 1 o'clock, and he finally stopped, and she said, you know, I've been considered Jesus, but I watch every church member that you have drive by me. And you're the first one to stop. He said, well, I'm a pastor and I love you. How can I help you? And I wonder what it would look like when we learn to be inconvenienced for one another. Philippians tells us this, guys. This is the Bible. I'm, I know it's offensive and I know it's hard, but prefer one another above yourself. So how do, we, how do we do this? And, and I think the best way to begin to figure out how do we walk out this Christian life that when people look at us, they'll begin to say, wow, they love Jesus. Like that's, like that's a deep desire of my heart. When people look at me, they're like, man, this dude looks like Jesus. That's what I want. I don't want to look like nobody else. Right? And so, so how do we begin to close the gap? How do we begin to do this? And I, and I think we got to look back at the early church. And I want to kind of walk through a little bit this with me. If you have your Bible, flip open to Acts. And we're going to walk through Acts. Get ready to jump around scriptures. I'm going to read them quickly, mark them, put a little underlines under them. But this is how you begin to understand what's going on and happening. God is speaking. We don't need to focus on the volume. We need to focus on the gap. It's relationship, community, and loving him. In order to hear him, we need to be near to him. All right, so let's, let's focus on this. And in Acts, so what did they do in Acts? And I think it's quite interesting. Right away, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, we see 120 people in the upper room. We, we see what's happening there, right? Pentecost happens. They're praying, by the way. In Acts chapter 20, Pentecost happens, 120. Peter gets up, preaches the first sermon. Right, post Jesus, first sermon, Peter preaches, 3,000 people are added unto the church. The church just became Omega Church. Day one, boom, 3,000 people. By the way, when the Old Covenant was instituted, this is just to give you a little bit more theological clarity of what's happening. When the Old Covenant, when Moses comes down the mountain, he has the two commandments. There is an orgy happening in the camp, a literal orgy, and 3,000 people are killed. The, the Bible says the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Life. The first time Holy Spirit shows up on the scene, there's 3,000 that are added unto the church, right? Then we go into Acts uh, 2, 4, verses 47. It says, daily they were being added. Acts 4.4, 4, the number of men grew to 5,000 men. Acts 5.14, more and more believers and multitudes were added. Acts 5.28, Jerusalem is Filled, they said, with your teaching. Now, let me give you a little bit of historical context of what's happening. I know I'm talking a little fast. 
I'm going to slow down just a little bit, but I got a lot to get through. In that day, they, they're believed to be over 200,000 people. And by that time, in Acts chapter 5, there's, uh, many scholars would agree that there's over 100,000 believers. Like, that's insane to think about. That quickly, boom, flipping a city upside down. Then you get into Acts chapter 6, verse 1. They no longer could talk about addition. It was multiplication. It went from addition to multiplication. Multiplying, add, by Acts 6, 7, it said increasingly rapid increase was happening. By Acts 21, the end of the book of Acts, tens of thousands. It's where we get myriads upon myriads. It was too numerous to even count by the end of the book of Acts. God was moving. So the question that begins to happen, the question that you got to ask is where did they meet and what did they do when they met? Right? What, what were they doing? How did they do this? What did this look like? In Acts chapter 5, verses 41, it's quite clear on how they began to do this. This was a dual strategy. They went from temple to temple, from house to house. It was in two different places that they were constantly meeting. And what I've learned in Western Christianity, where we live today, we do the temple really well. But we've lost the house to house. We've lost the intimacy of gathering. So all we do is we come up here, we do these things, and, and we're really good on a Sunday, on a Monday, on a Wednesday, on whatever day you come, but we've lost the house to house because, beloved, the gospel comes with a house key. When's the last time you had people around your table that didn't look like you, talk like you, believe like you? Because one of the markers of the early church was radical hospitality. That when you came in, you felt like family, even though you didn't think like they thought, believe like they believed. But they were so intrigued by their lives. You know, <laughs> during the persecution that was happening in Rome during that time, you know who they wanted to watch their kids? Were Christians. Why? Because they were honest. They were truthful. It's wild to think about what was happening in that time. And so they had a dual strategy. They were in the temples, and they were house to house. And this is what they did when they met. This is a crux verse. If you don't know this verse, this is where you need to underline. This is where we're going to sit today. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. We're going to read it together. I think we have the scripture up here, right here. And they devoted themselves to apostles' teachings, the fellowship of breaking bread and prayers, all came upon every soul. Many signs and wonders were done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they were attending the temple, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Let me pray real quick. Lord, tonight as we dive into these verses, God, that has so shaped the church. God, tonight that we would be challenged, that we would live differently that we would choose to live in the community and the gap of the distance between our hearts would close. The individualism would close. And that we become a community, a family of disciples that look like you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I think, I think the first thing you see in Acts chapter 2 is they devoted themselves. Right, right away, they devoted themselves, what, to the apostles' teachings. And, and I, think, I think this is, if, I, if I'm being honest, this is twofold. This is individually, as a believer, that you need to learn how to feed yourself. Can I, get, can, I get, can I be real? As a pastor, as a preacher, one of the most annoying things that I hear when people say this, they're like, I just don't feel like I'm getting fed anymore here. I'm like, great, good, you need to learn how to feed yourself. Like, if this is the only dinner you eaten, beloved, no wonder you hungry. You've learned to fast so much that you only eat when you come to church. 
Let me, let me say it this way. I, I love this. This is, this is, if you remember last week, if you were there last week, this is spiritual formation. You have to be intentional with your spiritual formation, right? They, they stayed daily within it. They, they, were, they were daily getting into the word of God, right? And, and I, I want you to see this. And I've, I've quoted this. You may have heard this quote, but I'm going to read it to you again. The Bible Engagement Center, they pulled 40,000 people. And what they found was people that read their Bible one day a week, nothing. Nothing is different in their life. Two days a week, nothing changes. Three days a week, there's a little blip in the radar, like blip, like it comes up just a little bit. But they found at four days a week, if you read your Bible four days a week, these, this is what begins to happen in your life. The feeling of loneliness out of these 40,000 people went down 30%. Anger goes down 32%. Bitterness in relationship goes down 40%. Alcoholism went down by 57%. Spiritual stuckness went down by 60%. Viewing porn went down by 61%. But isn't this true of Psalms 119 that says, how does a young man stay pure in all of his ways? By regarding his life according to the word. Right, And then you, you see this, is sharing your faith went up by 200%. Because what you put in comes out. What you allow to form you will be the, what you display to the world around you. You know, in the old covenant, we had to go to a priest to be the mediator between God and that. Now we have Jesus, who is our mediator, that we have access to. Right. And so this is what we've done in church world. And we have to be careful of this because it's easy to do is if all you get out of the Bible is listening to sermons, it would be like me going to somebody to ask how my wife was doing today. And I'm like, how was she today? Did she do that little hair flip thing she be doing? Did she smile? Did she have a good day? And that would be my interactions with my wife. That's exactly what we do when all we come to God and hear is on when a sermon is being preached or we worship him on a Sunday morning. We're treating God the same way. Beloved, I am not your mediator. No preacher is your mediator. You have direct access to him. And if the only engagement you have with God is in a service on a Sunday, on a Monday night, then you're missing the reality of it. And that's why it's easy for you to deconstruct your faith to say, I don't even know if he's real. Because you've only experienced him through somebody and you haven't experienced him to who he actually is. And let me, let me, let me be real, real. Because when I get up in the morning, anybody else read the Bible and you're like, man, I don't even know what I'm reading. <sighs> Jesus. And, 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 and I understand. But beloved, if you don't learn how to be disciplined, it will never become a desire. If you don't learn how to sit yourself in front of the apostles' teaching to allow it to shape your life, you will allow TikTok, you will allow YouTube, you allow everything else that you have going on in your life, your coworkers who you don't even like, begin to shape you. And you're like, I don't want to look like them, but all you do is take advice from them. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I'm being dead serious. Some of you take advice from people you don't want your life to even look like. Why are you going to them? Will you, can I just ask you? And, you know, and you're looking for them to agree with you, but you don't want your life to look like their life. Why? Why have you brought yourself so low? Beloved, you need to think rightly of yourself. This is, this is what Paul says again and again. He says it to Timothy. He says, watch yourself. You have to have a sober reality of who you are, right? He says this, keep a close watch on yourself and your teachings. Persist on this because it saves yourself and your hearers. First Timothy chapter four, verse 16, he says this in the book of Acts 20, verse 28, pay careful attention to yourself. He says this in second, first, second John chapter one, eight and nine, he says, watch yourself 
that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive the full reward. Why is he telling us to continually watch over yourself? Because when you begin to be in charge of your spiritual formation, which you are, is it's easy. You, let, let me, let me kind of give a picture of what this looks like. Is our faith isn't is in like a, a linear line, right? We're just kind of walking with Jesus, walking with Jesus. But when we're being formed, we're walking with Jesus, we're walking with Jesus. I'm watching this, I'm watching this. I'm back here, oh, the, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Nope, now I'm listening to this, I'm listening to that. I'm listening to all of these things. Can I pick on y'all for a moment? I know y'all gonna hate me for this, but what you watch shapes you more than you know. What you listen to, oh, I'm gonna pick on, what is in your car right now? If I got in your car, would you change it? Listen, I live my life this way. Anything that I would say in the pulpit, I will say to you in a conversation. My language does not change. My words don't change. I am who I am wherever I am. Sometimes it's not always a good thing. I've said some dumb things before in my life. But I'm being, I'm being honest. Are, are, you, are you diligent about who you're becoming? Are you paying attention to what you're listening to? Because what you listen to shapes you more than you know that it does. Have we become so desensitized to the culture because we're watching it for entertainment and it's getting into our heart and we wonder why we feel so disconnected with all the things around us? And I'm not preaching legalism. Please hear what I'm not saying. I don't want you to feel, wait, oh, Jeremy's a legalistic person, like you can't do anything. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's what I'm saying to you is your spiritual formation is massively important. And I don't want you to take it lightly. I pay attention to these things because I've realized that it affects me. What I watch, what I see, what I do, and how I listen to the things around me begin to amplify. Listen, I have little kids. I got four of them. I can tell you what my kids have been watching on TV based upon their behavior. Because why? It shapes them. What's shaping you? Ask yourself these questions. Take a look at yourself. I don't want to stay here too long. It's, I only got 10 minutes left, and I still got four more points. Um, my second one is, is they, they stayed in fellowship, right? My second point, if you're taking notes today, by the way, the devil doesn't like it when you do, is my second point is community, right? Community. That, that is so essential to what it looked like to be a believer is you need community. You cannot be a long-range Christian. We need each other. When you think that you can get good all by yourself, do you ever notice how many times you fail? Like, I don't want to tell nobody I struggled today. God, you see me. You love me. I'm good. But the reason why you need to confess, according to James, it says confession isn't for forgiveness, by the way. It's for healing. The reason why you're bound to something is because you're so scared to confess it so that you will be bound by it because you're scared of the shame that comes with it. But when you're willing to say, I don't care who sees me, that the shame that has bound me will not bound me anymore, and I begin to confess it, it breaks the power of darkness over me, and it allows me finally to heal. See, I love, I love that the Catholic Church still practices confession to us Protestants. Here's the difference is you don't need to go confess to a priest, but you do need to confess. Here's how I live my life. I confess to who I'm most scared to confess to. Why? I'll tell you why. It's real simple. It's because when I'm willing to tell the person I'm most scared to, then it breaks every little bit of power of shame that it can have over me. Because if I just come over here and I'm talking to Matt, I'm like, man, oh, I'm going to pick on you fellas. I love you. Oh, I'm about to break my ankle. Listen, listen, I'm going to pick on y'all. I know y'all about to get mad at me for this. Is all of when, when you're struggling with pornography and all you do is tell your friend and you feel good about it and you're like, oh, man, we're going to get better together, right? And we're going to do all these things, but you're still living in the constant bondage that you've been in. Beloved, can I tell you to try to confess who you're most scared to? You know, when pornography broke off my life, I've shared this here, is when I told my dad. Because I was scared to tell my dad. It's the last time that pornography had a hold on my life. This is back when I was in my early 20s. I was 21, 22 years old. 
and it no longer had a bound. Let me, let me just say, this is what it looks like to be in community. This is what John 15, 12 says. It says, we are called to love one another. In Galatians 6, 20, it says that we're called to carry one another's burdens. God, that's not easy. Because some of y'all burdens are heavy. <laughs> Don't look at your neighbor right now. You're thinking about their burdens right now. <laughs> like, I don't want to deal with your stuff. I got my stuff. <sighs> We're called to forgive one another. Ephesians 4, verses 32. We're called to encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Guys, we're called to be known. I just, we've learned in our Christian faith to build up barriers. How many of you grew up in church? Okay, can I, can I pick on y'all? I love y'all. I'm picking on myself. I grew up in church too. Is, you know what you're really good at? You're really good at faking Christianity. Do you know why? Because you grew up in it. You know what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. You know what, we, we, we're really good at pointing out, and I'm bringing you to the prodigal son, is the older brother versus the younger brother. The younger brother wasted his life on pig slop, prostitution, and all these things. We're like, look at that sinner. Look at him. <laughs> we're good at pointing him out. But the older brother who stayed home, who stayed in the house, had as much iniquity in his own heart as the younger brother. But we're good at seeing the younger brothers, the older brothers, we've been really good at hiding it. We've been really good at, I know what to say and when to say it. But if I'm gonna let people in, they're gonna see that I'm really just as jacked up as he is. See, I'm, I was the younger brother, I was the prodigal. <laughs> I got all the issues, so I see. I see it all. I know how to fake it. I know how to do all the things. And I refuse to live my life with any piece of that inside of me. And I still, we're just good at it. And so what I'm asking you tonight to do as a community of disciples of Jesus is to let down your walls Notice, be watchful of yourself where you've learned to fake it in church. You can look like the most spiritual person in here. You want me to tell you how? You got to have a stink face too. Like when they look at you, I don't know why people, when they get the Holy Spirit on their life, they're like, it's like they just smell somebody fart and you don't want to say nothing. Like, yeah, yeah, that's the Lord. Like, I mean, if you just get that face, everybody will leave you alone. In a prayer meeting, just put your hands out, close your, close your eyes, and just say, hmm, da, 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 da. You know, if you don't know how to pray in songs, say, I should have bought a Honda, right? Just say it really, really fast, and everybody will think you're the most spiritual person in the room. I'm being honest. I used to do it. <laughs> When I was, when I, my mom would bring me in, I used to laugh at people praying in songs. I'd be like, bum, bum, da, da, da. I would just be fine. Because I was a clown. They think I'm praying in tongues, and really I'm just joking them. Like, now I pray in tongues, and now I'm like, I, I, I can notice the people who be doing that. I'm like, brother, I know what you're doing, bro. I see you. I'm like, I know what it feel like. I, I understand. But I want to introduce you to them. And it takes community, and you have a choice on what community looks like in your life. You can engage it or disengage it, but can I tell you this? And, and I'm going to I'm gonna try to move a little bit quicker. I'm almost done. I have three minutes left. Um, when you are not in real community, you will limit your influence on your own relational capacity. You will limit someone else on your own perspective of God, and you will limit the church. Let me say that again. When you are not in a real community, you limit the influence of your own relational capacity. You limit someone else from the perspective that God has given you to influence the community, and you limit the church. Slower. When you are not in real community. <laughs> About to hoop. Uh, 
You know, the first time I hooped was at a funeral, and I felt so bad. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> um, anyway, I apologize. Let me move on. You limit the influence of your own relational capacity. You limit someone's, someone's perspective of God through you, and you limit the church. When we love like he loves, he loves first. We don't respond. We love first. I just want, guys, we, we, we don't sit in the corner and wait. You are a place and a conduit of heaven. Bring heaven. You love first. And I promise you, I promise you, I have a deep, like, I have, my biggest fear in my life is rejection. You will be rejected. Every time I share the gospel, a fear rises up inside of me. They're not going to like me, man. <laughs> like, like this little voice. Uh, it's, I like to call him little Jeremy starts to rise up. Like, I'm like, shut up, man. Like, like it's okay. Like, but the, the thing of it is, is, is we love first. Like, to the LGBTQ community, we love first. Like, we, we, don't, we don't come at them and try to tell them how to live their life. We love first. We, 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 we see people drinking and we see friends. We love them first. What does love look like? It goes to where they are. It meets them where they're at. And it keeps bringing them back in. And it, ooh, when they make you mad, you keep loving. <laughs> Some of you got to go deal with your family tonight. Your brother, your sister, your mama, your daddy, who you're not living in right relationship with, buddy, you're living in disobedience. The Bible says don't come up here and worship if you have an ought with your brother. Love first. Okay, I know I'm, y'all like, I ain't never coming back here. Um, One of the primary ways that the love of God is manifested in our lives is by the way we love one another. The primary way the love of God is manifested in our lives is by the way we love one another. Okay, y'all ready for some more toast? Let's go. Politically, can we love the other party, whatever party you're a part of? He loves first. They see the world differently. They're all going to hell. Well, good. Love them to heaven. I'm wondering how much I should go into because I feel like I can get in trouble. No, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, come on. I'm trying to keep my job. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Listen, when, 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 like, when people, when people don't look like you, don't talk like you, don't act like you, that, that think differently than you, that, that make you mad, that, that, that act differently than you, buddy, you're supposed to love them, not talk about them. In church world, what we've done, and we've been really good at it, is we tear people down to build ourselves up. I wasn't even going to go here, but in James chapter 3, thank you for moving your legs. Y'all are so kind. Y'all are like, oh, he's coming through. Part of like the Red Sea is cold, right? And so, uh, like, like, when you begin to see some of this stuff, this is what James says. He says, salt water and fresh water can't flow from the same cistern. He's talking about your tongue. He actually says is when you begin to tear people down and you speak evil, that it's corrupted with hell's flames. Hell's flames can be in your mouth when you begin to tear down your brother and sister in Christ. Why? Because it creates division. This is what Psalms 133 says. It says where there is unity, it demands a blessing. So what is the greatest scheme of the enemy is to divide the church. You know how many denominations we have? Over 45,000. And what we've spent more time doing is looking for differences on why we can't run together instead of saying, you love Jesus, I love Jesus. We're going to run together. I need you in my life. I know you Baptists and you don't believe in speaking in tongues. Right, we're going to do this together though. 
going to be your crazy Pentecostal friend, and I'm going to still show up and love you. One of my good friends, he's a Baptist preacher. He thinks I'm insane, but he still loves me, and I love him. And he still invites me to preach. He's like, bro, just don't go into the tongues thing. And I'm like, I got you, but I will do signs and wonders. Are you okay with that? And he said, if they get healed, I'm good. And I'm like, every time I come in, somebody gets healed. It's so dope, right? I'm like, ah, what you going to do, Baptist? And I'm <laughs> Unity, brother. Like, I mean, you can't deny it. And um, guys, this is, this is my brain. I'm sorry. I am digressing way too much. All right. Third point. Third point. I, and oh, man, I'm already two minutes past. I got two more points. All right. So third point tonight is prayer. Guys, we got to be a praying people. Prayer, you're, let, me, let me say this. I love this. Uh, Lyle, who was here, he posted this today. You're better at prayer than you think you are. You're better at prayer already than you already think you are. Because if I ask this whole room, like, how many of y'all are good at prayer? Most of y'all are like, oh, man, I don't want to raise my hand. Like, there's like two of you that are like super proud of like your prayer life. You're like, yeah, I'm good. I'm an intercessor. Beloved, do you know the intercessor is not a gift in scripture? Why? Because we're all called to it. Prayer has to be the, like, it has to be our life. It has to be what we do. The Bible says, in all things, pray, right? Like, all the time, pray without ceasing. Pray, pray. Like, how do you begin to do this? It's communion with Jesus. Talk to him. Just start talking to him. Like, I'm trying to teach this to my kids, and they're like, well, I, I, we, we literally do this thing. Like, like we, started, uh, we started putting post-it notes that what were things we're asking God for, and then literally we put them to, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this, because some of the things they're asking, I know that God is going to answer, and we're going to move it from prayer to answer, and they're going to watch God begin to answer their prayers. If you're not journaling what you're asking God for, you're going to miss seeing what God's doing in your life. Because God's going to answer your prayers. Beloved, he does. He loves to answer prayers. And he loves to tell you no. Thank God he tells you no. You need to thank God every time he tells you no. Like, I, honestly, I just, I just think about some of the dumb prayers I've prayed in my life. Like the girl that I was with before I met my wife. Thank God he did not answer that prayer. Right? Like, oh, God, I love her so much. This is going to be a unity in heaven. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Right? And then he breaks it up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't bring me to the place that I thought I needed to go, and you brought it about the way that you, that you were doing it. It's communion with him. It's knowing him. It's breaking bread. What is breaking bread? Breaking bread and prayer. Breaking bread is communion. It is literally Eucharist, giving thanks. It has to be part of who we are. And hear me, hear me. I know that a lot of you, if I went around this room and I said, what's your prayer life like? How long do you pray every day? Some of you would give me a fluff answer like, ah, you know, maybe five minutes. <sighs> Listen, I know what it's like to sit out here and hear a preacher say, I pray four hours a day. And you're like, man, I ain't never going to get there. Anybody ever feel like that? Here, here's, can I just help you? How do you start this? How do you practically create prayer in your life? I think there's twofold. Number one is set five minutes. This is what I do. I do it longer than five minutes, but I'll set five minutes. I put my phone over here because I'll look at my phone when I get bored. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Instagram, TikTok will be pulled right up, right? <laughs> Emails, and then I just wait, and I put an alarm because I know that my phone will go off. I don't need to go over there and check what time it is. And I'll just begin to sit. And what I don't do when I come into a place of prayer, when I'm, I'm, I'm practicing this place, is I don't come with all my requests. I start with thank you. Like, when we're singing about the cross, beloved, our hearts should be exploding. And when it's not, we need to ask ourselves, how do we grow numb to this? Has it become too familiar? Bring it back to thanks. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. I thank you that you're good. I thank you. And you begin, you begin to thank him. Like some of the things that you begin to have. You know, some of, and, I, and I, what I found is some of the deep requests that I have in my heart that I never even brought up to him, he begins to bring. I mean, and, and there's times where I, I, I've had, listen, I wrestle. I'm a wrestler. 
I'm a wrestle God. Like we got some, we got something to talk about, Jesus. He's like, yeah, we do. <laughs> I never have won yet. Like, but like one day, he's like, yeah, I got you, boy. <laughs> like, like I don't know. That's that's so much ridiculousness in my head. But like, but seriously though, like I, I want to wrestle with them. Like I have questions. I have I need answers to. I, I need to figure these things out. And oftentimes in the wrestle, like he's just like, I'm I'm just gonna sit here. I'm gonna sit here until until you can be content content in your in your wrestle some of you are looking for direction right now right now you're looking for direction god's like i want to i want you to be in contentment first i want you to be okay with the season that i have you in i want you to get every little thing that you got in this season and i'm not moving you until you're ready to go forward so you need to learn the place of prayer start with five minutes that's all i'm asking five minutes of your day do nothing. If, if you live in a house crazy with people, I got four kids, I know what it's like. Go in the bathroom. When they come to the door, I'm like, I'm pooping, leave me alone, right? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to Jesus, but they, they don't want to come when I'm in the bathroom, right? And I'm literally, like, I had to learn. I had to learn to get space. I had to create discipline. Now I desire it. It's something that I crave. I went on a road trip to Houston for three hours, and I was so excited because I was going to have three hours in a car by myself to talk to Jesus. It was amazing. I need to do more car trips by myself. And let me tell you the other thing. It's get to a corporate prayer meeting. Pray, learn to pray by yourself. Get to a corporate prayer meeting. You know the most intimate thing you can do with another human being? It's not sex. It's prayer. Let me explain why. <laughs> if, I, if I was to grab Trent, me and Trent were to pray together every day, we didn't talk anything, we didn't talk at all about anything else except prayer. We just prayed together. By the end of a year, I would know the deepest desires of his heart. I would know what he's asking God for. I would know what he's thanking God for. I would know about his relationships between his parents, his family, all of the dynamics that are going on. Why? Because when we begin to pray, we open up the intimacy of our heart and we bring it before him. Pray with somebody but get to a corporate prayer meeting. Make prayer a habit of your life. All right, I'm almost done. This is my last point. I could, hey, let, me, let me just say this. Let me, let, me, let, let me just challenge us in prayer. This is what happened when they prayed in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter four, verses 31, is when they prayed, the room shook. When they, when they knelt down and prayed, things began to happen in Acts chapter nine. In Acts 28, verses eight, they prayed for the sick and they were healed. People were filled with the Holy Spirit when they began to pray him. This is one of my favorite stories. In Acts chapter, right, when, when Peter is in prison and and, and he's there, and, and it says an angel comes, and it literally, it says punch him in the gut. It literally means punch him. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't like, hey, man, Peter, get up, man. It was like, block him, get up, boy, right? Like, like you know, I do, anyway, uh, that's how I think it happened. And so when he gets there, he, he's almost in a trance until he gets outside of the prison. He realizes he's not sleeping. He's like, oh, this is for real. And then when he gets out of there, he, he gets to the place, and, and they... <laughs> they come to him and they're like, oh, Peter's here. And they're like, no, there's no way it's Peter. He's in prison. They don't even believe that it's Peter. It's wild, right? And this is what it says in Acts chapter 17, verse six. It says that, but the church prayed. James is gonna happen, but when the church prays, things begin to happen. Beloved, when we pray together, heaven begins to move. Don't forsake your place of intercession and realize that when we come together, for those that pray day and night, Luke chapter 18, surely he answers those who pray day and night. Like, like there's something that happens when the church prays. And we gotta believe it. All right, I'm almost done. Last point, last point. Is the fourth one, is, is the thing that I think is so powerful, is, is the last part of this, those were being added day by day. They were just being like Jesus. It's time to start being like Jesus in your job, in your schools, in your relationships. <laughs> Colossians 1.27, it's one of my favorite scriptures. It says this, to those to them, God chose to make known among the Gentiles the riches of his glory, of the mysteries in heaven, which is Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. We got to begin to walk like him, talk like him, and bring people in. Beloved, it's not the role of the evangelist. It's not my job to save people. Jesus does it. But it's also the reality that we're called to do the work of the ministry. This is why the fivefold is given, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, it's for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Beloved, you are called to share the gospel. You are called to love first. You are called to be spiritually formed by what Jesus has said and done in your life. You're called to walk in deep. The Bible says this in the Greek, koinonia, a deeply shared life with your people. And I'm, I'm talking about the people that you don't like across the other part of the room. You're called to walk in koinonia with them. Like somehow we've gotten this idea that they're going to be saved in heaven but on the other side. Like, we're going to walk together forever. <laughs> Some of us are like, oh, man. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Introverts unite. But here's how we do this. How do we practically walk this out? It's number one. You guys got to learn discipline. It's not a sexy word in our culture, but discipline. What does discipline look like in this? It looks like, all right, I'm going to be disciplined in reading my word. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to set time. Guys, hear me. You have to make it holy or it's going to be movable. It's either, it's either going to be something that you cherish or that's flexible within your schedule. Second thing is, is I don't care and I say this with all boldness. I don't care if you go to church here or not. But wherever you go to church, be all in. Be all in. Be planted. Be planted. I, I, I want you to be in church. I want you to walk in the fullness of who you are in and through Christ Jesus. But be planted. Go all in. Be committed to the community. Be committed to prayer. Be committed to one another. Be committed to these things. Because here's what I don't want to do. Because tonight we could preach a really good word. We could have a really good altar call. We could do this. Or we can choose to be a committed group of people to be in disciples of Jesus that are making disciples, that are watching people walk in the fullness of who they are. And this is what begins to happen when this happens. I love this scripture. Acts, excuse me, Acts 17 6, Acts 12 was when, when the church prayed. Acts 12, 5. Acts 17, 6, it says this. When they're talking about Paul who came into the town, these are the guys, unbelievers, talking about Christian. These are the guys that have turned the cities upside down. This is what unbelievers should be saying about when you walk into a job, when you walk into your cubicle in the morning, when you walk into your classroom, that you're turning the atmosphere upside down. Why? Because you look like Jesus. You're a carrier of his presence. Colossians 1.27, the hope of glory in the earth. Beloved, look around the room. It's in you and it's in me. We are carriers of his presence. Don't live for a lesser gospel. Don't live for a lesser life. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the round bags and square holes. The reason why you don't fit in, Jesus didn't fit in. He changed the system. Bring his presence to every form and aspect of your life. Be disciplined. Be committed. The third one is start discipling someone that doesn't know Jesus. I'm not talking about, I don't know, I'm grappling with this. I don't know if you can claim to be a disciple of Jesus and you're not actively discipling other people. What I mean by that is the Bible is quite clear. The great commission is for all of us. It's to go and make disciples of all people. I've shared the story last week of my boss who I didn't like and he ends up being a guy who's changing the earth. He's planted multiple churches, ran crusades, seen blind eyes open, deaf ears here. He's, he's seen signs and wonders. Like he's an amazing, amazing man. 
the person that God has put into your life that's irritating you, maybe that's the person you're called to love. In fact, I can biblically say that that's the person you're called to love. Guys, I don't want to do, I don't, I don't want to just do this and we live in our bubble and nothing's changing around us. We can have great revelation and just stay in it. And we just keep sharing our revelation back and forth. Well, this is what I got. 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 And the world looks at us like, what are y'all even? Because we're disagreeing about a revelation. I want my faith to be so infectious that when unbelievers look at us, they're like, wow, how, how, what is this about your life? This is happening in the Muslim world. This is happening in, in Lebanon right now is people just live differently and they have private conversations and they're leading people to Jesus, not ministers, just believers. Stop living a lesser life than what he's called you to. <sighs> this is what I wanted us to do tonight. We're almost done, I promise. I know that I went stupid long. I apologize. I'm a preacher. I don't apologize, but I do, but I don't, but I do. So if you're offended, who cares, right? Deal, deal with Jesus. The Bible says you don't have any right to be offended. No offense. Um, the Bible says this about repentance. We've thought repentance is this idea of just coming and laying my sin down and walking away. Actually, repentance means metanoia. It means that your mind is being blown, that you can live differently than what you did before. Repentance needs to be a normal thing, is that when I'm having a revelation from Jesus, there is a new mind map, there's a new pathway that I haven't seen before that I can live in now because he did. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn from the lesser way that I was living into the greater way of partnering with his heart more than I did yesterday. Does that make sense? That, that, that yesterday's fullness, hear me, that you can walk in the fullness that God has for you right now. Tomorrow, that fullness should be greater. Why? Because you know him more. Right? The capacity is beginning to grow. The capacity of what God has for your life day by day is beginning to grow. And beloved, if you feel like, man, I just need to lay some things down, lay it down. But pick up the space for capacity in your life to begin to grow. For me, even today, I'm like, God, I want my mind to be in line with you. You've given me, according to your word, the mind of Christ. I don't want little Jeremy picking up his little head. I want to knock that little Jeremy back out and say, Jesus, have your way in my life. Okay, y'all ready? Y'all ready? Yeah, I like it. Thank you for being done, Jeremy. And this is what we're going to do. If you're with me, you're like, man, I need a shift in my life tonight. I I'm ready to shift even tonight. This is what I want us to do. We're not going to do this big altar call. But if you're with me and you're like, yes, I need this in my life. I want Acts uh, 2, 42 through 47 to be an evidence in my life. I need this. Would you just stand with me and say that I need to be committed to the community. I need to be committed to devotion. And I need to be committed to the place of prayer. And I need to be committed to being like Jesus, that I'm a carrier of his presence. Because here's the thing, is we can walk out of here and have a great experience with God, but beloved, you're called carriers of his presence. This is a decision and a choice that you have to make tomorrow morning. When you're groggy and waking up to go to work and you don't want to get out of bed in the morning, what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? It's up to you. Across this room, real quick, I need you to be bold with me and vulnerable. Right now, if you're struggling with your prayer life and you're like, I'm not talking about like you're praying for 30 minutes. I'm trying to get to an hour, but you're, you're just trying to start praying like on a consistent basis. Would you wave at me? Come on, right? Okay, everybody, I'm going to give you a practical application right now. This is what I want you to do tomorrow. 
pull out your phone right now all over the room if you waved at me i want you to be bold and you have to make practical application because the decision right now will not change anything you literally have to challenge yourself to be different tomorrow look at your calendar find 10 minutes and make 10 minutes within your day put it on there right now just do it now and say 10 minutes i'm going to pray at this time and do it the next day. As soon as you're done, say, tomorrow, at this time, I'm going to pray. I'm not going to let a phone call bother me. I'm not going to let work bother me. You know, I used to tell my boss when I worked with him, I said, hey, listen, everybody I work with smokes. They have a 15-minute smoke break. I'm taking a 15-minute prayer break. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, bro, you can't do nothing. Legally, I'm allowed to. <laughs> like, and he's like, you're an idiot. I'm like, yes, I am, but I love Jesus. And he ended up getting saved anyway. So, like, look at the Lord. But I'm serious. How many of you are struggling reading the Bible every day? Same thing, pull your phone out, make it time, make it a priority, make it a priority. You prioritize what you wanna prioritize. And if you don't prioritize it, it prioritizes you. I know this probably was, yeah. It was what it was. I want everything Jesus has for me. Can y'all say, do y'all want that? Y'all want everything Jesus has for us? <sighs> With me, would you put your hands out before the Lord? And just say this with me. God, tonight, I lay my life down. God, I want to live with everything you have for me. Jesus, forgive me. God, tonight, we prioritize you. We prioritize your people. In Jesus' name. Let me, let, me, let me just give you one more practical call to action step as we close tonight. There's a little wall. If you're new with us, we love you already. You can connect with us over there. We have groups on Thursday. Be intentional. Show up. And I want to challenge you, for those of you that, that waved at me with prayer, show up to a prayer meeting. I learned to pray with a bunch of old praying ladies. I'm serious. I would, I would go to a prayer meeting with a bunch of old ladies and they taught me how to pray. It was the best thing I've ever done. And so prioritize a prayer meeting this week. Be in a prayer meeting. Get there. Make it a priority. 5 p.m. in the prayer room on a Monday night. Get here early. We fast anyway. Don't eat dinner. Get a smoothie on the way, right? Like whatever you need. Like, like get here at five o'clock and pray with us and have expectations and watch God begin to change the way you view and see life. Family, we love you. We have a, we'll have a prayer team available that will be at the altar in just a moment. But I wanna bless you. I, wanna, I want to see us walk differently. I'm so all in on this. So let me bless you tonight. I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that today there's a shift in your life, that there's a practical reality and a practical shift that God is doing something brand new inside of you, that discipline will become a desire that's inside of you, that your prayer time will become the most coveted hour of your day. And I even prophesy some of you that have not even developed it, that it's going to be a season where you begin to hear God like you've never heard him before. I speak over your life that when you begin to read the Bible, that the words would literally jump off of the page and onto your heart. And I pray over you that when you begin to share the gospel, that it becomes normal for you to begin to share your experience and your story, that you will see signs and wonders. They follow those who believe. I prophesy over your life that when you begin to see many and many and many people come into the fullness and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Today, the Bible says you were blessed when you came in. You're blessed as you go out. Go in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Family, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh. Grab somebody on your way out. Don't do life alone.